Hello, welcome to BMC 2020. It's a tough act to follow Carl Cox, the king, but we hope this panel will be insightful and provide some interesting um, ideas and future um, strategies for you to implement around diversity and inclusion in the electronic music industry. Um, the panel today is hosted by the Association for Electronic Music, which is a not-for-profit trade association created to represent the interests of the companies and individuals who are involved in the electronic music industry and to advocate for best, best practices for the genre. Um, as I mentioned, this topic is around diversity and, in and inclusion, and it's a topic that's been on many people's radar for the past few years. Um, but 2020 has rightly so brought it even further up the agenda as we undergo probably one of the biggest transformations many generations will have ever seen from um, the Black Lives Matter movement to a number of different sexual harassment moments from Eric Murillo and the kind of electronic music's Me Too moment. Um, it feels like this is the right time to be discussing this and like I said, hopefully we will present some interesting ideas around the future of diversity and how you can implement new strategies. The case for diversity, uh, diver diverse culture is very clear. Um, numerous reports highlight that um, a diverse culture would generate two, X more, two times more likely to meet financial targets. A company that's diverse is six times more likely to be innovative and agile eight times more likely to achieve better business results, and the list of um, benefits really outweighs any other reason not to have a diverse culture. So before we go into it and explain what diversity is, we'd like to, I guess, introduce everyone on the panel, um, explain who you are and what you're doing. So if we can start with Samantha. Hi, thank you, Inda. Uh, my name is Professor Samantha Warren. I'm a professor in organization studies at the University of Portsmouth, but I am also a member of the female DJ collective, SISU, and I'm um, behind the platform In the Key of She, which is investigating the career experiences of female female identifying and non-binary electronic music producers. Um, and I'm also a co-chair of the AFM Diversity and Inclusion Group. Excellent. Uh, thanks for the great intro, Inda. Uh, my name's Raj Ramanandi. I'm the co-CEO and co-founder of um, Inchorus, which is a technology company uh, and training company more and more these days focused on inclusion. Um, we do uh, a fair bit of work across the music industry, particularly in the electronic music industry, um, and work very closely with um, AFM, but we can talk a bit more about that later. Hi, my name's Shino Parker. I'm the co-founder and director of Motion Artist Music, um, and I'm also a member of the AFM Diversity and Inclusion Group. Amazing, thank you. And I'm Inda. I work in a company called Graphite, which is an entertainment company focused around brand partnerships and innovation. And we also manage a number of um, artists. But obviously, we've got an incredible panel here, very broad um, set of backgrounds and experiences in the industry. Um, but before we kick into it, I guess the first thing we want to do is we hear the term diversity and inclusion used quite a lot. But Many people don't really understand the difference between the two. And I guess one of the first things we want to do is really break this down as a starting point. So, Shino, if you could define what improving diversity means and looks like in electronic music, please. Um, so I think the most important thing is to, first of all, like look at the origins and the roots of electronic music. And what's really interesting about it is, is that it's born from gay clubs in Chicago, black and Latino disco. It's made from te technology that has been um, that we've bought from across the across every co continent, um, and um, and it's also been enjoyed by people, millions of people around the world. Um, and on the dance floor, everyone feels equal. Kind of fast forward to the millennium, and what you what we've kind of seen is that we've got the creators and the people working within the industry, unfortunately being very white and male. So for me, the future looks like not having to point out that a lineup is all male, not having to look at a speaker com uh, conference lineup and say that there's nobody from of varying ethnicities on there, and also not being trolled for calling it out on social media. That's very interesting. And, and Raj, I guess um, from your perspective, how would you define the term inclusion in the context of electronic music workplaces and events? So whenever we talk about inclusion, we're talking about the culture. So um, we differentiate diversity and inclusion. And diversity is, uh, is about the numbers, is how, how people and in what numbers they're being represented based on um, their differences. Um, their protected characteristics, which we can talk about a bit later, but the inclusion side of things is about what 
kind of culture exists within the workplaces, in the various environments that make up a particular industry? Um, and are you welcoming that diversity within, um, within that culture? Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know whether you'd add anything to that, Samantha. But. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, with everything that's, that's already been said. But for me, inclusion is about being able to be yourself mm -hmm. and not have to change yourself to fit into that culture, um, which I'll talk a bit more about that in a little while. Um, and diversity, for me, there's sort of kind of two sides to it, really. There's the visibility element, which is super important for representation, role models, and, and so on. But there's also the behind the scenes element as well, the more invisible stuff, which is, you know, having minorities in positions of influence and power as well that may not be quite so visible, but, but actually, if you like, are kind of the rudder steering the ship. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a whole load of issues, I think, that, that come in. Amazing. And, and Raj, I guess I've, I've been following your journey probably for the last two, three years. Um, I think, the, the, and we'll learn a little bit more about what Inchorus does, but one of the things you've been doing is working with the AFEM on an industry initiative to tackle um, systemic racism, discrimination and bias in workplaces and events as well. Could you tell us a bit more about um, the objectives and, and the project? Yeah, sure. So... Um, coming back to that point about workplace cultures um, and how companies um, across industries, this is not, uh, you know, the electronic music industry is no different to any other in any any kind of potentially bad ways, but companies are, are, are capturing or managing their culture in the wrong way. They are, or, or they're not managing it at all. It's as, it's as if um, it's not something that can be um, proactively um, uh, improved. Uh, part of the problem is that when a company looks at any business function, um, they are looking at the data. Um, but when it's come to managing culture, they're lacking the right kinds of data, in our opinion. So they might be capturing um, data um, from engagement surveys in sort of potentially medium to large, large size, size companies are more and more frequently kind of doing annual surveys where they're capturing um, how the workforce feels about certain things um, such as um, I know, line management or their workload or the new coffee machine. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, companies might be capturing cultural data from exit interviews or whistleblowing solutions, um, which again, we think is, is, is valuable data, but not particularly representative of what we're obsessed with, which is what is the lived experience, what happens day in, day out, and what are the everyday behaviors and interactions, which ultimately define what a culture is for us. Um, so in Chorus, um, its kind of, its genesis was based very much on um, leaning into the, the academic research in this field, particularly around microaggressions, which I'll explain in a second. Now, that study is you know, over 50 years old, um, born from the civil rights movement, um, and, and numerous universities will be exploring and researching in their psychology departments um, the effects of them, the definitions of them, the manifestations of them, and potential ways to improve the situation. So we work, we were very lucky to work with um, uh, one of the leading academics in the field, Professor Gina Torino, who essentially co-wrote the seminal text on microaggressions, which are... Um, which are not the more serious incidents of bias and harassment that happen, but the more uh, subtle, um, but the far more frequent incidents. Um, and so working with her, we designed um, a, a fairly simple web app where anyone in a, in a workplace can log an incident anonymously in about 60 seconds. Um, so it's that background that we think is really important to try and bring into industries and try and bring that way of working into more and more companies. And so the initiative with AFM is about um, trying to get the industry to work together and have a few companies leading from, from the leading the pack, if you like, to say, you know, we are, we're going to embrace this way of working um, and um, essentially kick off with a little bit of research across the industry where we get some insights as to what are those, what are the day-to-day -day behaviors? What is the culture actually like? Who is it affecting? Um, are they reporting these things? Um, and off the back of that, that data set, we would like to, as a collective, so uh, very much led by, by AFM ourselves, and there are two um, big players uh, that we're not announcing just yet that are joining us and, and, and we're looking for a couple more. Um, that will uh, be party to that research, disseminating it across the industry, and then sitting together to look at 
um, looking at what those problems are, not so that we can dump those problems back on the industry, but very much with the lens of here are the here are the insights we have. Let's t let's together look at the the evidence based best solutions to those kinds of problems, and then again, you know, collectively, I say that a lot, collaboratively, start implementing those solutions. There's there's no other way that you can start um, making that kind of wholesale whole sorry. Uh, wholesale cultural change alone. I mean, we think it requires collaboration. We think it requires sweating those small details and looking at the lived experience. Um, and we think it requires that kind of approach to take a much more preventative approach to some of those more serious incidents that you spoke about, Indra, at the beginning that we're seeing more and more. Because it's the, if the culture is ignored, those bigger incidents can kind of, um, you know, smack you in the face and surprise you all. Yeah, I guess it's interesting because when you think of the topic of diversity and inclusion, there's a, a, a natural assumption that it's the, you know, demographic data of a company, for example, right? You know, how, what's the makeup of male to female and wage gaps and everything like that, which are extremely important topics. They're ma macro topics to look at an organization or an industry from a top top line perspective but I guess what you're doing is is on a more micro level understanding the um, behaviors of an organization where they might not truly understand if they are inclusive or they might believe that there is no um, sexual harassment that occurs within the organization because it's not to the level of rape for example it's but it's still equally as harmful at a smaller level which creates uncomfort for people you nail it on the head I think it's you know we're very much focused on the, the macro and the bigger incidents but all of that doesn't happen in a, the macro incidents don't happen in a vacuum. They're happening in a continuum of, you know, as uh, I talked about behaviors, but behaviors, interactions. Um, you know, a, a, a meeting is a, a meeting in a workplace is a, almost a cornerstone of how work happens. And if those are, if there is uh, discrimination or bias happening at that level, it's going to seep its way throughout the whole in, uh, the whole industry. So yeah, I, I um, feel that. The obsession in many industries is looking at pay gap, which was important, looking at pay gaps, what we now start, are starting to term stay gaps is what are the retention data is like. Um, but the, the why as to why they are where they are and how you move them, the clues are in those micro details. Yeah. That's fascinating. I guess just um, on to the next point on, on this one, and I think data clearly seems to be the, uh, one of the foundational points of building a d diverse um, music industry as well as a diverse and inclusive organization and collecting this data in a, in the right way and collecting credible data is is of course hugely important and Samantha it'd be really interesting to learn more about the AFPM survey that you've been working on um, which I guess you can tell us a little bit more about it and how you went about it. Yeah sure um, this is a project that the diversity and inclusion group have been working on for way before I became involved. She now, I believe, you kicked this off a couple of years ago now. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Hildeling from the Netherlands and also uh, Hanai Brand uh, have also been involved. And what we were trying to do before, in fact, it, we had the relationship beginning within Chorus, was to get this this evidence base and data, data uh, from the industry about how people feel about diversity and inclusion. Because I think you're absolutely right, Inda, the uh, the numbers are really important, but they don't actually tell you the the lived experience. The term that Raj used just now, which is one of my favourites. Um, how does it actually feel to to work in this this context? So the survey itself uh, has forty eight questions, which by and large. Um, cover people's feelings, beliefs, opinions about diversity and inclusion and their own experiences. And we sent the first wave out for people to fill in in September, December 2019. Um, and it went out via the AFM networks, BMC's networks, AIM, ADE, and generally on social media. And we got uh, 229 respondents. And that was interestingly about a 50-50 gender split. So that was quite interesting, given what we know about the uh, male dominance across the industry. Um, looking more deeply at who filled the survey in, we were a little bit disappointed, but, but unfortunately not that surprised. 80% um, of the survey respondents were white or described themselves as white. 80% described themselves as straight, um, predominantly from the UK, Netherlands and Germany. But we did get responses from about 12 um, countries. So what was interesting and what we were deliberately trying to do with the survey was to get data beyond the live sector. So this was about um, industry players, perhaps more behind the scenes, where 
the limelight on diversity and inclusion is perhaps not shone so so directly. Um, and 68% of the people that filled the survey in were from record labels and distribution, a further 13% from the tech sector. So that's exactly what happened. We did actually get that, that, uh, that sector of, in, involved. So what did we find out? Well, the, um, some headlines, uh, which is all we have time for obviously on this panel. Um, good news, 90% of the people that filled it in saw the organisational and business benefits of having a diverse and inclusive organisation and culture. However, 20% still considered that D&I was not a problem in our industry. Now, I know that means that 80% of people do consider it's a problem, but that's still a fifth of people that fill it in that said, yeah, it's important, but it's not a problem for us here in this industry. So I think that's, that's quite an interesting finding. And um, in terms of what we do about that, um, and I should also say that the original idea and driver for the survey was around gender diversity, but also from an intersectional di dimension, which, as I said, you know, a predominantly white sample, straight sample, has that, that has issues, and that's something that we need to address in, in future years. Um, but to go back to, to what we do about that, we asked a series of questions about positive action, about uh, quotas for hiring of people from minorities. Um, and whilst 90% of the people that responded would support positive action, interestingly, only 57% support quotas. So, you know, that kind of harder line of actually we're going to have 50-50 across our organisation is not something that's... That, that's particularly well supported. And I found it quite interesting that 30% of that, 57%, uh, were women and non-binary respondents. Um, but then, paradoxically, three quarters of the survey respondents also felt that we should not go beyond a measure of merit when we're hiring. So although they're saying, you know, 90% of people are saying we need positive action, 75% of people are saying, yeah, but, but actually merit is the only thing that should count when you're hiring someone. So there's a contradiction there, which, and I think as Raj said earlier, we're not alone in this, in the electronic industry, uh, in having these contradictions. Um, as we expected, uh, findings confirm that most um, organisations have a minority of women. 65% of the respondents work in companies with less than one in four women on the management team. So that's 25% or, or less uh, women. And women are twice as likely than men to feel they are in a minority at work. Um, and the fact that has come out of this is that three quarters of those people feel that they had to act like one of the lads. Now, there were also some men who said the same thing. Um, but the fact that you have to, as we were saying about inclusion earlier, that in order to, to fit in as a minority, you have to pretend to be somebody you're not, takes a huge psychological toll and has all sorts of organisational implications for engagement, for, for retention and, and so on, and just general well-being. Um, so even though they feel in a minority, the men that said they felt in the minority... Um, still said they felt they belonged in the organisation. So I think that's quite telling, that even when you're a minority, you still feel like you should be there. Whereas for the women, that was less the case. Um, coming down to uh, the bullying and harassment element of the survey, 61% of the women that identified as a minority have experienced harassment of some sort. 42% of those were in the workplace and not a single male respondent reported harassment. So I think that's quite a stark finding and something that we need to work on. Um, and finally, the women who identified as a minority said they were half as likely as their male counterparts to feel their work is taken seriously. So going back to the microaggressions, these are the kinds of things that just chip away at your day-to-day -day confidence as someone who doesn't feel they particularly belong. They have to be somebody that they're not. They have to behave in different ways and that they're not taken seriously. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's some of the findings that have come out of the survey for this year. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And I guess, you know, touching on it, the importance of uh, an industry collecting this data and people also, I think a lot of times people might see these surveys coming up and not choose to take part in them. And I think the importance of actually sharing that information and collectively as an industry, you know, putting our thoughts together is hugely important because we then get people able to theorize about how 
we can change this and what we can actually do to make a difference. Um, where can people find out more about the survey? Yep, it's going to be available um, on the Association for Electronic Music uh, website. The full report, full report is being uh, prepared. It's a lot later than we expected because... COVID. Uh, I know that that's the stock excuse, but it's made life very difficult for lots of people in lots of ways in this industry. Um, so yeah, the, the, the full analysis and the full re uh, results will be available. <clears throat> the new survey is also about to be launched. So please, 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 we want people to fill it in. Um, and we particularly want to encourage people from um, BAME communities, uh, people from from uh, gender expansive communities and so on to complete the survey so that we can have that cross-sectional, intersectional data set. Because at the moment, what we've got is mainly data from white, straight people, albeit 50-50 men and women. Interesting. And I, I do wonder if there, there are ways to... Uh, promote this, these types of surveys in, in different contexts that they do resonate with a wider target audience for them to want to engage with it. I think these are questions that we have to ask ourselves when we do see the sample is not representative of the industry that we're targeting. I think we there is a shake-up required in, in a number of different ways and not that's not discrediting the, the work. I think it's just a question we should be asking. Um, you know, from from an AFEM perspective, I guess it's really interesting. But yeah, AFEM has been talking and thinking about and acting on diversity um, topics and inclusion topics for a long period of time, um, and want, pushing for diversity to be front of mind when people are making employment decisions or program programming event lineups and conference panels. Um, touching on that latter point of conference panels, I know AFEM are launching a diversity charter concept for conferences um, to create, I guess, more diverse um, conference panels. And can you can you touch on that and and give some insight into um, what the objectives of this are. Sure. Um, so the diversity charter has been created to advocate for diversity considerations to be front of mind when finalising panel lineups, looking at the overall programme of speakers at a conference. Um, we all know how difficult it is to actually have a balanced panel um, whilst also like pairing that with your speaker expertise, it's not that easy. I've, done, I've tried to do it myself a few times and it is really difficult. But we're hoping with a few key principles that we'll be launching that um, all the electronic music conferences that are partner with AFEM will be able to use this resource. Um, I'm gonna to read to some of the uh, principles. So, strive to avoid panels with only one ethnicity of speaker and to attain balance of speaker ethnicity across full conference program. To strive to avoid single gender panels and to attain gender balance across the full programme with an overall target figure of 50-50. And where possible, seek to provide speaker opportunities to new talent and to speakers who are less established on the conference circuit. Inquire about speaker options with relevant companies to help broaden potential speaker choices in line with diversity requirements to ensure the correct person for the panel. So, yeah. Interesting. I guess just... Touching on the reason of why it's so important that panel lineups are, are diverse, as much as um, uh, event lineups are, mm. is you know, on the one hand, and I'm sure there's other reasons as well which you could touch on like why this is happening, but for the next generation to come through, being from a diverse background, to then see people who are similar to themselves, maybe from a similar background, in positions of power or you know, able to to thrive in an industry that they might have thought is not as diverse, I think is hugely important. But, you know, what are, what are the other reasons that, I guess, you know, wh why why do we need diverse line conference panels? Well, I mean, from my own personal experience, I, I can go back only maybe four years, and I've been quite often the only female in the audience, right? So, um, and then been quite often the only female on a panel. Um, and that's... That's been quite difficult for me on a personal level, you know. It's, you know, it affects your confidence. And I think being in the audience and seeing a completely diverse lineup um, will fill anybody who is feeling a mi in a minority, will, will give them confidence to be able to speak and to be able to strive and to be a success, basically. It's interesting. I just wanted to sorry, I just wanted to jump into your research because I think it's a nice segue into this whole piece. And you know, you've been progressing a lot of work and research around understanding and addressing gender imbalance in the production of electronic music as opposed to the performance of it. Um, so, can you tell us a bit more about what do the current imbalance look like, and um, what do you think are the reasons for this situation? Yeah, I'm, I'd be delighted. And um, just to pick up on that, it's also about claiming expertise. It's about sort of decentering the expertise from the cisgendered white male 
of a certain age um, and showing that actually there's a whole range of expertise for, from all sorts of different sectors. And I think that's important for everybody to see, not just minorities. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's super important for conferences and the diversity chart is excellent. Um, but my research has been around, as you right, said, about uh, the production of electronic music because um, whilst there's a lot of female DJs, um, and I'm particularly looking at gender in this research, uh, there were, at the time I started doing this research, I could find far less women producers of electronic music. And in a digital age, uh, I don't want to teach anyone to suck eggs here, uh, but we are seeing a move from DJing as a source of reputational capital through to production being that important um, asset to have if you want to be taken seriously as an artist. Um, and so if women aren't doing that, we've got a problem on our hands because uh, bookers are booking artists and not just DJs. So that was what motivated the research. And in terms of numbers, it's exceptionally difficult to get a handle on the numbers of women producers. And when I say women, I do mean women, female identifying and gender expansive. The 2% figure, you may have heard this around 2% of music is produced by women, 98% produced by men. That actually comes from the Annenberg Inclusion in uh, initiative which is based in LA and they actually it's not electronic music it's based on an annual survey of the top 600 billboard songs pop songs on a six-year rolling period and that's where that figure comes from two percent of the of the people on the credits of those tracks are women um, but there are some anecdotal pieces of of, um, uh, of evidence from our industry um, they're going back a little while now. 2010, 2011, only 7% of registered Ableton users were not men. Um, and I quite regularly, it's quite sad, but I quite regularly add up the number of tracks not made by men in the Beatport Top 100. Um, I literally count them. I look for, it's not particularly scientific because I'm just looking at DJ's names and checking people out if they're um, androgynous. There's usually somewhere between five and ten tracks out of 100 that are not made by men. Um, I went through the hype charts the other day, 900 pieces of music, and there were 25 or 26 um, that were not made by men. I mean, obviously, I didn't look at every single artist, so this is not a scientific study, but it gives us a flavour. And that's fascinating to me. Why, in an age when technology is democratising music production, that's what we've been told, why is this happening? So um, some of the underlying reasons that have come from the research so far, and I've done about 50 interviews now with um, female and female identifying and non-binary producers, um, EDM production, it's very, very techy, you know, fairly obviously, really. Um, and girls are put off tech at a very young age. They still are. Um, the, 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 the technology is coded masculine from a very young age. A lot of this is gaming technology. You've only got to look at a studio and, and you don't think, girl, you know, there's, there's nothing there that, that speaks to us on this sublim subliminal symbolic level. Um, so we've got an issue from the beginning that um, we're not encouraging girls to, to, to get excited by technology and for it to be cool to be into tech. Um, I've also found that, this is particularly coming from the labels that I've interviewed, that women tend not to submit their tracks to labels. Uh, interestingly, some, some people you know, would disagree with that by saying, yes, I do. Um, but the labels, both male and female owned, have been saying, you know, women aren't sending us their tracks. What are we supposed to do? Um, a lot of women self-release, certainly the people I've been talking to, because, frankly, they can control their creative product. They, can, they don't have to deal with an industry that perhaps they find difficult. But it does mean that smaller labels fall under the radar, maybe. Um, hostile environments. We're going to come on to this uh, in a lot more detail in a moment. But, uh, or perhaps un unwelcome environments where people feel unwelcome, both on offline and online. Um, are a contributing factor. One of the reasons that people don't come forward for panels who are from <clears throat> minorities is the fear of, of the negative publicity around that or that they, they don't feel confident being a minority on, on that panel. And online, um, online situations are particularly horrific. There's been one this week with a, a producer uh, who's, who put a studio session up on, 
on Facebook and just a whole raft of misogynistic, unnecessary, nasty comments. So why would you put yourself in that position? Uh, these are broader cultural issues uh, that, that we have to sort of look at. But it puts women off being very visible because what I found in my research is there are loads of women producing music, just that we're not seeing them in, in the, you know, they're not getting the exposure. Interesting. And just, just to double check, how much time do we have left? <laughs> We've got 10, 10 minutes, All right, so we, we have quite a few things that we wanted to run through, but I want to get more concise now and make sure that we cover all of the most important topics. Mm -hmm. Raj, I want to discuss with you very quickly, uh, this year has been, I think for many people, probably the strangest year of their existence, probably um, since birth. Um, so w one of the th things I wanted to ask is, you know, it's, it's really taken the public outcry of, um, and demonstration following the unlawful killing of George Floyd in the US in May. Um, to, to kind of bring to rise the issue of systemic racism. And it created a, a domino effect across numerous industries uh, for people to really wake up and realize how unfair and imbalanced the world really is in many different ways. Large organizations have, you know, in some cases, very rightly so. And, you know, hopefully it's not just a, um, a, just a gesture that's going to disappear in a few years. But, they, you know, they've, they've pledged funds and put their foot forward to try and make a difference. Um, in some cases, you know, investing millions to, to um, change the makeup of their organizations. But smaller companies struggle to do so. And so it would just be good to hear from you what, you know, when these smaller companies are wondering what should they really do, what, what would be your suggestion and thoughts? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and obviously the, the, the music industry is particularly made up of lots of smaller organizations. Um, one of the key points is um, collaboration. So, you know, we, we talked about this earlier, but what can smaller organizations learn from the bigger organizations in their industry who have the resources and bandwidth to um, kind of perhaps take this not more seriously but kind of lean into action a little bit more um, so that's one of the things that we are um, very keen to um, be uh, one of the core outcomes of the work that we're doing with AFM on the on the collective um, is sharing best practice and almost we talk about open sourcing what companies are doing around DNI. So, what can small organisations learn from large organisations? Um, that's one of the things. The other, th the other thing that has put off smaller companies who have the who often have the will, but are a little bit wary of where to start. Um, and so, one of the key, another one of the key outcomes for us from the the collective is to sense make for smaller organisations is, you know, what should they be doing and um, where can they where can they get access to be able to do that, um, free or cheap? There's a big fear that doing this is expensive and we don't think it has to be. You know, getting, a, getting the right policy in place isn't expensive. Um, making sure that you have someone in senior management that oversees and is responsible for diversity and inclusion isn't expensive. Um, making sure that you have um, some basic training that you roll out for your, you know, even if your team is five people, it's not, it doesn't have to be expensive. And, you know, that's something that we are very keen to kind of get out there. Um, so yeah, yeah, there are some key pillars that we definitely we've rolled out in other industries, and we can see the value of that. Um, those same initiatives being rolled out um, in the music industry, but we we don't want to preempt that. We want to lean into the data, understand what the specific challenges for this industry are, and then um, come together to find those solutions and and, and really drive um, systemic change. As you said, is um, and, Systemic change is not something that bigger organizations have been particularly um, keen on promoting either. I think there's been lots of statements of goodwill, but there hasn't been leaning into action. And that's something that we are you know, very keen to um, progress. Thank you. And I just wanted to touch on um, sexual harassment. And a few years ago, I remember I was at a panel at IMS and I heard someone say, you know, when is the electronic music industry going to have its Me Too moment? And I think we we just did with Eric Murillo. And, you know, in, in essentially, I'm sure most people know what happened. But, you know, uh, someone who essentially is, is accused of numerous sexual assault and rape allegations and in his death, glorified by an industry in many cases, pr primarily by men. Uh, Sheena, I just wanted to ask you a question about this on a broader level. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the code of conduct against sexual harassment that the AFEM has launched? And also, if you can just touch on the sexual harassment um, assault line. Okay. Um, Thank you. So I think it was yeah, two, two years ago now, we launched the sexual harassment helpline in response to reports that both our general manager Greg Marshall and our old CEO Mark Lawrence had 
kind of been receiving from members of the industry. Um, and at that time, the Me Too movement in electronic music was not ready. Um, so we launched a helpline in order to give people a support network, really. Um, after that launch, um, we kind of looked at everything and we kind of agreed that actually improving the future was as if not more important than kind of confronting the past. So the DNI group, um, led by Sarah Hildring and Matt Adele, uh, pulled together a, a code of conduct, wrote a code of conduct for the industry. Um, we consulted members of AFEM and um, we're hoping that that will have a public launch within the next month or two maximum. We've, it's been launched to our membership and um, so it's, it's imminent at the moment. Um, just something that I want to touch on regarding helpline and, and looking for support is that it's really important that people use it and it's there. Um, it, people don't report sexual harassment. They don't feel comfortable reporting sexual assaults. Um, and just having a line there is so important for people. In terms of your own mental health as well, me knowing that that line is there and that somebody can call it at any point, it's a 24 hour helpline, is great. But we do need to encourage people to use it. We definitely do. And it's something that I think we all need to do as an industry. I agree. Thank you. It's, I think it's an important topic to raise and, and something that needs more attention and awareness for people to, to feel com comfortable to, to, you know, use these kind of um, initiatives to, to when, when they need them. Now, I know we've, we're, we're running out of time, so I just want to very quickly, if we can just touch on, you know, the, the top line narrative here was around what effective mechanisms are there currently and what more needs to be done to promote diversity and inclusion fight racism and discrimination. Now, this this is a topic, we could be discussing this all day long and probably not even touch the surface, but if you could just give me your quick two cents, you know, from around this topic and what you feel really needs to be the focus. I'll, I'll go first because I'm sitting next to you. Um, I think it's everybody's responsibility. I think uh, it's about everybody's um, job to examine their own privilege, to speak up when they see something that they, they don't agree with and that makes them uncomfortable. Um, I was doing a breakfast session earlier this week and a similar question came up um, and somebody's response was um, that their company gave them time to think about these things so it's not always about money it's not always about bandwidth or expertise but it's having the time to have the conversation um, and and so what we yeah what we advocate is yeah make the time and if organizations like AFM are helping with resources that's a great combination um, I think for me is uh, for all of us to take a look at ourselves, understand that we all have some level of unconscious bias, to use the resources that are available to us, especially from AFEM, um, and to improve ourselves. Thank you. And I guess what's really fascinating for me is even in the middle of what, the, the, probably like I said, the, the craziest, most transformative um, period that most any generation would have experienced for a very long time, we have opportunities like BMC to come together as an industry to make tangible goals and you know create some sort of change around how we're going to make these ambitions real. For, uh, one of the things I think is very interesting, and you're seeing it right now, is the rewiring of our systems. Like the the systems, the behaviours, the cultures are all being really attacked and addressed, rightly so. And I think. Um, you know what we need to do is have these conversations continue having them have those tangible goals and try and make those ambitions real and really think about how we're rebuilding um our system our culture for the future generations um so thank you that have we got five minutes left i've got five minutes we keep going um <laughs> you bought that time yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay i guess well we can continue from here if we were going to touch on let's see um we've talked about data we've talked about sexual harassment um uh, anything you would add on some of the things you're working on or actually we're, we're talking specifically around mechanisms are there any companies that you're looking at or have seen or organizations initiatives that you think we could take inspiration from not just from the music industry but looking outside um of music i can, i actually i can say that i'm i'm speaking on a panel at ade and we will be looking at other industries and see where we can learn from so one of the one of the companies that will be joining us will be somebody from netflix um i understand that they have done brilliantly when it comes to diversity within 
their, within their company. And I think it's something that the electronic music industry could do so much better with, with is to actually look to other industries instead of trying to solve everything within our own industry. Sometimes it's good to look at others and learn from them. So, yeah, I think Netflix are a good example. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about the... I've, I've read... I know they had a big culture playbook, which was... I don't know, 80 slides long, which is an interesting read, actually, but uh, I haven't looked into their uh, diversity and inclusion work, but I will do. Um, I, I think the, the point that Shine makes about looking at other industries is, is really valuable, and it's particularly interesting. It's useful for us to be, uh, as in chorus, looking, working in other industries and then also having some um, deeper conversations in the electronic music industry. Um, oftentimes, there is a feeling that your industry is the worst. Sometimes there's a feeling that it's the best. And I think the reality is they're all very similar. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting listening to some of your um, uh, stats from your research. They, they mirror a lot of other industries. Um, I think, so for example, in the um, technology industry, I think it's about 3% of funding, startup funding goes to women. Um, and you're talking about producers making up roughly 2 to 3%. Um, uh, what's, what am I saying? I, 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 I'm going to come back to that same point again is, yeah, can, what can you learn from other industries? But f to make meaningful change, you have to have a, a category um, that is working together. And it's very difficult to do that across industries. Um, but yeah, the, the, the beauty with something like what AFM is trying to do is, is bringing these smaller, larger companies together with resources and some of the data that we're collecting. I think it's quite a, a powerful combination. And just, just to say that within the industry, to bring the focus back within, there are uh, particularly a, a couple of labels really doing um, a lot of work in terms of positive action, particularly around female producers, where they're actively so soliciting contributions by women and they're being inundated with excellent quality tracks and they're finding fresh new sounds. And, you know, they, there's all of this cool, cool stuff going on. But equally, there are also people who are afraid to do that because of this so-called backlash, you know, this idea that, oh, you know, the status quo will be, will be disrupted. Well, I would say go ahead and disrupt it because we need to do that. You know, silence is not an option. It's no good sitting there being comfortable. Um, you, everyone needs to be shaken up, really. But there are some great, great labels out there doing that already. Tool Room are one of them. Hospital are just starting a mentorship scheme for uh, female producers in drum and bass, um, which is going really well. And so, you know, it's about being, being strong, sticking a stake in the sand and saying, we're going to do this and it's important. And you might not agree, but this is what we're going to do anyway because change won't happen otherwise. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I love to look at sport as an example and see what, what are the changes that are being done there. You know, look at the FA, for example, uh, collaboration with Disney to basically get more women into football. And it's an interesting campaign you can, you can have a look at. And even uh, big media um, organizations like Channel 4 um, broadcasting the Paralympics and doing it in one of the most empowering ways possible. It became one of the greatest campaigns I think people have seen on television. I think these are the small changes where it's about looking at an underserved or underrepresented community and thinking how do we how do we present them in a way that actually makes more brings more attention to them. And that's um, I think it's a role for the whole industry, but also big media organisations and brands and global corporations have a very important role to play when it comes to this kind of transformation and, and creating a more diverse and representative representative um, industry. But as I said, there's, there's so many interesting ways that we can uh, explore this further. I would suggest everyone to follow um, everyone on the panel. And if you have any questions, you know, dig further and um, enjoy the rest of BMC. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.